Hello everyone, welcome to this lecture on radiation detectors. In the last lecture, I discussed the basic principles of radiation detectors and certain properties of detectors like energy resolution, detection efficiency, dead time, etc. Today, we will discuss the basic principles of gas field detectors and what are their applications. The gas field detectors, the basic principle is schematically explained using this diagram here, where we have a rectangular geometry of the gas field counter. It could be a tube, it could be a you know, rectangular box, which contains two electrodes, namely cathode and anode. And you have to have such, let us say, some window through which the radiation can enter the chamber. Once the radiation enters the chamber, already you know that whether it is alpha or beta or gamma, it will cause ionization and excitation. And the detector functioning depends upon collecting these ion pairs. It could be positive ion and electron in some cases electron holes and so on. So the idea lies in collecting the electrons at anode. So you apply a bias at the anode. Here you apply a pot pot potential through this battery. Electrons go towards the anode. And then when the charge is collected at the capacitance, this capacitor will discharge through the resistance and you can, uh, you can put a voltmeter to see the voltage signal at this particular place. So essentially the it is the it is the mobility of ions, particularly the electrons in the electric field gradient, that di dictates the performance of the detector. So when the electrons are moving across the electric field gradient, that gradient is given by V0 upon D. So it is like a parallel plate chamber. So between two plates, there is a linear gradient in the electric field. So if V0 is the potential applied at the anode, D is the distance between the cathode and anode, then the electric field gradient will be given by V0 upon D. And then the how fast the velocity electrons will drift towards the anode depends upon the drift velocity, which is given by mu epsilon upon P, where mu is the mobility of the electron, P is the gas pressure, and the epsilon is the electric field gradient. So the typical, you know, an electron will take about uh, microseconds to reach the anode. Maximum, it can reach much faster. But you know, later on we will see there is an avalanche of electrons produced in different types of detectors. So that may make the process little sluggish. Whereas the positive ions being bulkier take hundreds of microseconds to even milliseconds to reach the cathode. So the principle of the detector system for a gas field counter is explained by this figure here where we have different zones of applied voltage V0 at this place and the, the, the voltage signal at the voltmeter. The relationship between these two quantities, the voltage signal at the voltmeter and the applied voltage dictate the functioning of different types of detectors. So the, to begin with, when you have very low applied voltage, let us say we are in the region 1, then this uh, the electric field gradient is not sufficiently high that the electrons will be able to reach the anode and positive ions will reach the cathode. Before that, they can recombine. And that is why the, as you up increase the applied voltage, more and more electrons and positive ions are reaching the electrodes. But even then, all the the primary ion pairs, electrons and holes are not collected. And so this is called the recombination region, means where the electrons and positive ions combine to form neutral atoms. So it is not useful for the detector. Then come to the second region, ionization chamber. IC means ionization chamber. 
and in fact these two graphs are for two radiations of different energy so higher the energy of radiation higher will be the the pulse height that you get in the detector so uh, in the second region ionization chamber the primary ion pairs that are produced as a result of interaction of radiation with the gas material all the primary ion pairs are collected and so that is why you see the pulse height remains constant over this region of applied voltage this is called the ionization chamber whereby you collect the ion pairs across the electrodes and it is a constant voltage because whatever the content pulse height whatever is the ion pairs are collected generally all they are collected then comes the second third region the pc the proportional counter where there is now a secondary multiplication that means whatever primary ion pairs are produced in the gas medium they are further multiplied because the electrons will acquire energy because of the higher electric field you are applying a higher potential and so this primary electrons can further cause ionization leading to secondary ionization and there is a multiplication in the number of ion pairs but that multiplication factor is constant therefore the number of charge carriers is increasing proportionately to the the initial energy of the radiation that's why it is called the proportional count when you further increase the applied potential to this region then now there is a sort of saturation type of occurring and this is called the region of limited proportionality and again this region is not useful for detector application but finally a situation comes where irrespective of the energy of radiation like 1 mv 2 mv or any other type of energy radiation you will find that you get the same pulse height in the detector that is called the gm region geiger muller region we will explain the details of the detectors subsequently so geiger muller gives you the same pulse height irrespective of the type of radiation or its energy now let's come to the first detector type that is the ionization chamber i already explained briefly about this that the ionization chamber depends upon the collection of primary ion pairs that means let us say the alpha going to a and I, the gas let's say argon gives rise to argon plus atom plus ion plus electron so this is the primary ion pair and collection of this primary ion pairs electro across the anode and cathode respectively will give rise to a voltage signal at the voltmeter so let us see how many ion pairs can be produced by a radiation of particular energy so for that will depend upon the w value w value is the energy required to produce an ion pair which is which should be in fact in principle should be equal to the ionization energy but now we know that all the interactions do not reach to ionization some of them may lead to even excitation and therefore the w value is higher than the ionization energy of the particular gas medium so the number of ion pairs that are produced is energy of radiation upon the w value the typical w values are given for different field gases like helium argon methane you can see here the ionization energies are in the range of tens of electron volt and the w values are higher than the ionization energy because the some of the interactions may not lead to ionization they may lead to excitation just let us have an idea about the what is the type of pulse height that we get in the detector in an ionization chamber so the pulse height in ionization chamber can be calculated from that circuit diagram which we show you have a capacitor and its capacitor will discharge through a resistance so let us see you have a 5 mv alpha particle so what is the w value w value let us take 30 electron volt so w is 30 ev and there are 5 to the power 6 electron volt energy of radiation so 5 this the energy upon w is the 1.6 to the power 5 amperes now just take typical capacitors of the detector system as 100 picofarads so the up the voltage signal at the voltmeter will be q by c where q is the charge c is the capacitance so you can put the charge due to this many electrons multiplied by the charge of one electron that is 1.602 to the power minus 19 coulombs and then the are uh, divided by the coulomb the capacitance 100 picofarad so that becomes 2.56 minus 4 volts or of the order of 0.2 millivolt you can see here that the uh, the signal is quite weak for a just 1 5 mv alpha 
because of that these detectors are not really suitable in pulse mode instead of that if you have a constant source of radiation you can use it in current mode that is what happens in a survey meter so in a survey meter you just uh, keep on detecting the radiation level in a current mode that tell you tell, tells you the level of radiation so anusin chambers are actually used in survey meter mode which are more qualitative idea uh, than the quantification of the radiation levels so the applications of anusin chambers lie in fact there are some cases like fission fragments fission fragments have very high energy of the 100 mev and because of that when the primary ion pairs we will get so compared to 5 mev it is not 20 times more so 20 into 0.2 uh, you can see here 22 into 0.2 so almost 4 millivolt so 4 millivolt is a good signal so particularly fission fragments can be counted in anusin chamber without any background and in fact in reactors no 35 uranium line chambers are used for neutron monitoring in reactors in addition to that they are also used in delta e detectors in particle identifiers in nuclear reactions where you have the heavy ions you want to detect them by using a delta e telescope but mostly in survey meters in current mode anusin chambers are used and in some applications like ion chambers where you have a big source of few curies or few millicuries then you can determine the absolute activity using a four pi counter where all the radiation that is emitted is deposited in the chamber and you measure the current so ion chambers are also used for measurement of activity of intense sources these are the applications of anusin chambers but in, when it comes to the routine counting from pulse mode we don't use them we use the other chambers other called proportional counters so in proportional counters if you recall to recall the curve v0 versus the voltage signal then this is the one so we had a so you have this anusin chamber region ic and then we have a proportional region where you there is a secondary multiplication so at higher voltage than the anusin chamber this primary ion pairs can further undergo ionization in the gas medium and so each primary electron that is produced it will cause an avalanche of uh, radiation ionization and then so there will be a large multiplication so this multiplication of ion pairs is the in fact the property of proportional counters and the important point is that the proportional the multiplication factor is constant suppose you have got n ion pairs produced as a result of primary ionization then the total charge that produced is m into n where m is the multiplication factor so the the main uh, point of these counters is that m is constant and that puts a strict requirement on the parameters of this proportional count and the typical multiplication factor is 10 to the power 3 to the power 5 so you can see the pulse amplitude will increase by this much magnitude but then this factor that fact that the m has to be constant put the requirement on the purity of the gas so there should not be any gas medium which will have a high electron attachment coefficient means any electronegative gas like oxygen or moisture they will they can pick up electrons from the ionization and so they can change the multiplication factor so typically argon gas 90% argon and 10% methane that is called p10 gas without any traces of a gas having high electron affinity like oxygen or moisture so this p10 gas is commercially available and they are filled in the proportional counter tubes so the question arises why this uh, methane is used in, in this proportional counters along with argon reason lies that when you have argon if you take pure argon then the the charged particle can cause ionization and sometimes it can also cause excitation so this excited argon atoms can emit photons ultraviolet or visible photons and these photons can cause photo electrons from the cathode so once this photon is reaching it's escaping out from detector volume upon reaching the cathode by photoelectric effect it can generate a photo electron and that photo electron is actually not wanted so this causes a spurious pulses so to take care of the spurious pulses that they don't arise we use a polyatomic gas with polyatomic gas which will collide with the excited argon atoms and the argon comes to neutral ground state whereas the methane gets ionized 
So we have from an excited argon atom, we have got X, the ionized methane molecule. And therefore, this uh, methane serves as a quenched spurious basis. So proportional counters, in fact, come in different modes like the sealed proportional counters. So this you have a cylindrical tube where you can uh, fill the gas and the anode wire has to be very thin, micron size, no, very, very thin. You can see here typical diameters of, let us say, 0 0.008, so 0 0.08 millimeter or 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.08 millimeter, so almost 80, 80 microns. So these thin anode wires are the hallmark of proportional counters because they have to be uniform in, in, in thickness. So if the uniformity is same, that means the electrical gradient is constant all along the length of the anode wire. In proportional counters, if you put, use them in the cylindrical format, then the, the you can have very high electrical gradients, which is given by at any distance r from the anode wire, B applied potential upon r ln b by a where b is the radius of the tube proportional counter tube and a is the radius of the anode wire and so you can see here that by applying a small voltage you can have very high electric field gradient so r ln b by a just to give you a feel if you apply 2000 volts as the potential at this battery then and b the radius of the tube is 1 centimeter the, the anode diameter is 0 0.08 centimeter then you can see by this formula we have at the anode wire 5 million volts per meter is the electric field gradient which is much much higher than that you get in the ionization chamber. So because of that you can achieve the secondary multiplication and then you can have the high pulse height in the In fact these this, the sealed proportional counters have a problem of you know you have to have very high purity of the gas there should not be any moisture or oxygen and because of that there are a variety of variant of proportional counters called flow proportional counter. The flow proportional counter what happens it is not a sealed tube but you have an assembly where you can allow the gas to flow from one side and it is coming out from the other side. You have a you keep the source in the center of the, the, the base plate. The base plate can be lowered down so that the source can be inside the cavity or if you want to, when you want to raise, when you go to count, you raise it up in the platform. And uh, this, uh, in fact, this can remove it from this side by using a plate system. So you can lower it and then took it out. Then you have the anode in the form of a loop on which you have to apply the positive potential. So the, the flow of the gas has got the advantage that the purities need not be so strictly such high. You can purify the gas. You can have a, in the in the circuit circuit you can have a loop circulation loop for purification. The advantages are many. One is that now the there is no window, so the, the like alpha particle there is no loss of energy of alpha in the window. There is no window. Source is exposed to the gas medium. Second is that the geometry is two pi, so you have almost fifty percent efficiency for counting. So very high efficiency. Resolution is 0.5 percent. You can see. For a 5 MeV alpha and 30 electron volt is a double value, you get 1.6 to the power 5 amperes. Resolution will be 0.6 percent. So you have high resolution, high detection efficiency, and the purity of the gas is not that strict now because you can purify the gas while it is circulating. So no window. So these are the advantages on now many places the laboratory, radiological laboratories have the low proportional counters of available in their counting systems. The proportional counters have lot of applications like you know if you are if you are using the wavelength dispersive X-ray diffraction system then for X-ray counting you can have proportional counters filled with high Z gases like xenon and krypton. With high Z gases will have high photofraction. For neutron counting you can have helium 3 to BF3 gas filled with proportional counters and uh, other than that you have the gas flow proportional counters for alpha counting, beta counting, even you can use the fission fragment counting in this proportional counter. So there are a lot of uh, applications of proportional counters. So you have, you want to use any gross counting of alpha, beta or low energy x-rays, you go for the proportional counter. Lastly, I come to the Geiger-Muller counter. 
Geiger Muller GM counter we commonly called. In fact, they are the, one of the oldest detectors. They were developed by Geiger and Muller in 1920s. And despite that, you know, after almost now it's going to be a century, they are still being utilized widely in laboratory experiments because of the simplicity, low cost, and ease of operation. Very easy to operate. I will show you a photograph of the detector system. So the gas, the GM counters uh, still are in the experimental laboratory when you are doing experiments for the MSc students or you know, any PhD students in initial training. In fact, some of the applications where simple counting is required, GM counters can be used. So if you recall again the, the graph, V0 applied potential versus the signal, and we showed that like for two detectors, so this was the recombination region, this was the ionization chamber, proportional region, and here is the limited proportionality. And now here, at still higher applied voltage, you will find both the radiations have giving the same pulse. So in fact, not only these two radiations, you take any photon, even one electron, one photon, anything will give you the same pulse. So that is the, the speciality of the GM counter. But the, this is also has the drawback that it does not distinguish between different types of radius. So I'll try to explain this uh, GM region in more details here. What I have shown here in this graph is called the, the cascade of avalanches. In proportional counter, what happened? Every primary ion pair, every electron that is produced in primary ionization, each electron produces one avalanche. So what I have shown here is the avalanche. Avalanche means each electron is multiplied several times when it is undergoing ionization in the medium. So an electron in proportional counter gave you 10,000 to 10,000 10, electrons. So an avalanche size is 10 to the power 3 or 5, 3 to 5. Whereas in the case of geiger muller counter, each electron that is producing an avalanche and every avalanche can produce other multiple avalanches. So it is a continuous process of avalanches generated by not only the primary electrons but also by the secondary electrons. And because of that, these GM counters have very, very high multiplication factors of the order of 10 power 6 to 10 power 8 multi times the, the signal is multiplied. So what is happening is that when the electron is generated at any point, let us say it is produced here. So this is a tube. You can see here, this is a tube, this is the anode wire and now wherever the electron is produced, it will try to go to the anode and along the path of the is going towards anode, it will be generating ionization. That ionization and during that ionization process, it can even cause that there will be excited molecules which will emit light. So UV radiation can be emitted. These UV photons can further cause ionization and generate another avalanche. Again, from this you can have another UV photon generate avalanches, and it can be from to the other side also. It is like an anode wire is you know it is in the tube. So you have all along the across along the surrounding the anode wire you have the gas. So on all sides of the anode wire there will be sequence of avalanches, and these avalanches can be generated by electrons or the UV radiations that are produced in the the excitation of the excited molecules. So this, uh, uh, this avalanches generate a large number of electrons and amperes. So ultimately what is happening that the so many electrons are collected within a few microseconds, but at the same time there will be a sheet of positive ions. These positive ions are going towards the cathode, but their velocities are much low. So what happens? Because of the slow movement of the positive ions along the anode wire, there will be a sheet, a cloud of positive ions. That's a space charge due to positive ions around the anode. In fact, that space charge becomes so high because that, that, that starts dictating the performance of the detector. So what happens that when the space charge becomes very high, the effective potential across the anode becomes low and then the detector stops function because you require a certain applied voltage. But because of the positive space charge generated due to several avalanches, 
effective lactic gradient becomes low. And this happens only when a particular amount of space charge has been created. So the, the process of avalanches continues till the space charge becomes so dominant that the detector stops functioning. So every time the space charge becomes reach a certain value, then the detector stops functioning. Because of that, the Geiger Muller counter will stop functioning only when so much of space charge is created. So this in, in, in fact essentially explains why the Geiger Muller counter cannot distinguish between different types of radiation because till that time the space charge is being created, you are going on creating the avalanches. So that explains the simple uh, functioning of the Geiger Muller counter. So, irrespective of the type of energy of radiation and type of radiation, the Geiger Muller counter gives the same pulse site. Similar, further, it cannot distinguish between different types of radiation, whether it is a single electron or if it is a X ray or alpha or beta or even frank prism fragment, all of them will give you the same pulse site. The pulse site, but the pulse site is very high, it is few volts. You can imagine. 0.2 millivolt was the pulse height in ionization chamber and now you have a very high multiplication almost a million times so you will have a few volts signal so you don't need even an amplifier and that is why it becomes very rugged of course it has there is a restriction on the fill gas helium or argon pure highly pure helium or argon gases are needed this will be free of any traces of gases which can form negative pile, so moisture and oxygen again are prohibited from the fill gases. Why this uh, strict requirement of this purity of the gases? Because again, the what happens that there are in fact there is some process called multiple pulse. So what happens that we we just now discussed that the positive ions are very sluggish to move towards the cathode. So, there is a cloud of positive ions along the anode wire, but eventually, even if it is few hundreds of microseconds, they will reach the cathode. And once they reach the cathode, the ions, positive ions, they get neutralized. During the process, that energy is released, energy equivalent to the ionization energy of the positive ions. If that, that energy released is the ionization energy of the gas minus the work function of the Okay. that much energy is released. So if this energy released happens to be more than the work function of cathode, then what happens? It can generate a electron from the cathode. So if the energy released during the neutralization of the positive ion is more than the work function of the cathode, then another electron will be generated at the cathode and then that electron which is not wanted so that electron can generate another Geiger discharge and that is called multiple pulses. So we do not want that the positive ion when it is reject the cathode generates another electron. So that is called the multiple pulsing which is not wanted in the Geiger number count. So the, Geiger, the multiple pulsing has to be quenched and that is done by different methods. One is the external quenching electronically. That means when you can reduce the high voltage temporarily for a time few, for a few hundred microseconds. So reduce the high voltage for a fixed time after every pulse, you can have electronic system. But you know it affects the count rate, you cannot handle very high count rate. So normally it is not a very preferred mode. Other methods are internal quenching, where you use a 5 to 10 percent of a second polyatomic gas of low ionization energy and having a complex structure, so like for example ethanol vapors. So what happens now, when this you have the positive ions, the positive ions can collide with this polyatomic gas and this polyatomic gas molecule get dis dissociated. So instead of that positive ion reaching the cathode and generating a, another electron for multiple pulsing, they can collide with these molecules and lead to annihilation, or it can even get dissociated. But then this eventually what happens that this polyatomic gases will get exhausted because they will get dissociated and because of that the lifetime of these GF tubes are short. Another method though is halogen quenching where you have a chlorine or bromine gas which, uh, which also get dissociated. So when the positive ion collides with this chlorine molecule Cl2, you have the chlorine atoms produced. Uh, 
And so, but these chlorine atoms can again subsequently combine to form the chlorine gas. Because of that, they have a long lifetime. So, 11 quantity GM tubes are very commonly available in the market. Lastly, the applications of GM counter, as I mentioned, you cannot distinguish between different radiations and different energy also. So, they are used for simple counting. Like if you have a simple beta count, beta active sample, you can count the activity. Or in a laboratory, you want to do experiments on statistics or dead time determination of a GM counter. So, this is a simple, this is the GM tube. And you can put the samples in different geometry depending upon that. There are these are the slots where you can put the sample, and you can see there is no amplifier. You straight away you take the signal to that this counting unit. You can apply the voltage, and this is a you know, very low cost instrumentation. Maybe about fifty thousand rupees. You can even now get a Geiger Miller count. So these instruments are very commonly used in the laboratory for demonstrating experiments on statistics at that time and if it is a pure beta source you can even count the activity. So I will stop here, I will take up the other detectors in subsequent lectures. Thank you.